Watch this. Must have services and pr products. Must have. Got to have that. Just got to have it. Oh my goodness, I've got to have that. Matter of fact, the life cycle of our products today, if you look at the last over from 1900s to the present millennium, what's happened is the life cycle is shortened. The reason being, products aren't, aren't created to last greater distances of time or life cycles. The reason being is they want to increase the sequences of sale because it drives profit to the company. Right? We're not creating products to last a lifetime. We're creating products to last a couple of years. Because we've been trained through marketing. We've been trained through society. We've been trained through peer group, right? That the product we have today will be obsolete in a mere few months or a year. Because of cycle and sequence. So must have services and products that are bedrock right now to us are subject to change. Now, this ought to excite you as an innovator. This ought to excite you as a person that is forward thinking, that looks into the future. Because what that tells you is that if you can keep a mind that can take in information, a mind that can take in the present items, articles, or products and services, and then look forward beyond this epoch of time or this sequence or season, then what that tells you is that you can build on the services of today for even something greater tomorrow. I present to you the brazier. It's now called the what? The bustier, the thing that they put around their torso in the 1800s is called a form, what, a fit? What is that thing, spandex? A corset is now called something different. What's it called? A shaper. A what? Reshaper? A trainer? A whatever. A waist shaper. Come on, ladies. I can't believe I have to. <laughs> but watch. What happened was a young gal saw the bustier, the brassiere, the corset, and thought, you know what? This is incredible in what it does in the waist training but you know what it's nostalgic it's an antiquity it needs to be reinvented put that in your notes reinvented simply means this you're finding a new purpose for the old you you're finding a new purpose for the old you the person that can continually reinvent themselves will always be on the cutting edge of product, service, and always of great value. They're called, here's another term, repurposing. I said this two years ago, and I, I don't know if you got it or not, or caught it. I said the person that can look at present product and service and can learn to repurpose them will lead in the next cycle of business. It's happening everywhere right now. Repurposing. I want to repurpose all the way until I find a greater purpose. Amen. Some people say, oh yeah, you're talking about a facelift. No, I'm talking about a mind lift where I can lift my mind above present to see things that are coming in the horizon. Amen. See, if we want to be innovative thinkers, we got to start thinking about cutting off some of the weights that take down our thoughts and literally deplete our mind from creativity. That was all free. On-demand services are easily accessible in our time in this moment. You're, um, you're an app away from the most challenging problems being solved in your life. An app away. Have you ever heard of app all? Isn't that amazing? Do you think that Apple went out and said... They set in motion one product, and if Apple would have stayed true and used some of our mentalities to, we're going to stay the course, guess what? Apple would have been reserved and resolved to simply making a desktop computer. 
But through innovation, through forward thinking, through understanding how society would change and the need for products and tools in the workplace, and also not that would just be confined to a desk or a cubicle, but one that could go with you, started to create in their engineering process new products, new services, innovation. See, to the person that went to Disneyland in the 1950s and saw the microwave oven and a vacuum cleaner, that was so forward-thinking to them, it was so foreign, that it was something that was tomorrow land. You and I go there today and we say, renovation. Like, no razzle-dazzle here, right? But what was that? They were... Walt Disney was ahead of his time. He was trying to change the minds of, of the people he entertained, his guests, into the amusement park. He tried to amuse them and muse them, two different words there, to bring them into greater innovation. I think we could use a good dose of Tomorrowland concert. Next year, I'm taking my wife to a Tomorrowland concert. I am. I'm going to shake it and bake it and candlestick make it. You know why? There's something to be said about being around people that have energy, a good vibe, optimistic attitude, right? Good outlook, forward thinkers. Hear me. Sometimes they're too busy to complain. That's a good thing, right? It's not a bad thing. Or maybe you want to do this. If you have a complainer in your life, just take them out on a Sunday or a Saturday skydiving. Strap them to an expert. Because when they jump, they can't complain. Their mind's diverted, right? Their attention's focused on something else. It may change them. They may have an enlightenment moment, right? A fast roller coaster. Maybe that's it. Moving on. Watch this. So these apps and everything we have is challenging the present, right? Solve our problem at a mere click. Click now. Purchase it now. And in that purchase, something about you says, this is going to change everything. This is going to change this challenge I have, this problem I have. And to, to, you know, to a great extent, it does. I have some apps that really help me on a daily basis. They really help me throughout my, my cycle of week to week and the things I deal with, in many aspects of life. There's nothing wrong with clicking an app. If it makes you more effective, more efficient, and certainly helps you, helps grow you and groom you, nothing wrong with it. Matter of fact, I'm an advocate of that. You know, I often say this, when's the last time you read something for the first time? I studied a topic you know nothing about. Hello? How do we expect to expand our horizon if we're always reading the same magazine? You know, if your, your brain's still wrapped in field and stream, let's take you out of the forest, Johnny Appleseed, and let's put you into something like the New Yorker. Read that for a change. What's that? Well, go and explore that. Newsweek, Time, The Economist, right? Sometimes we're so wrapped around the gossip of Hollywood and the inquiry that you know what? We can't just pick up something and study and get a new thought and create a new attribute in our own life, a new skill set. Oh, it's just boring for me to pick up, you know, and figure out how to learn to use Word. I just don't want to, I don't want to look at a tutorial to learn how to use that. I don't want to look at a tutorial to create, you know, why do I need Photoshop? The point I'm trying to make is if you'll give your brain to something new that you've never done before, it will get very creative and it may breathe life into that which you do daily. Amen? That's good stuff. Watch this. Put this in your notes. Wouldn't life be so easy if every problem was just an app away? Or if you could just click it away? You'd be walking through the mall. Click. 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 Go to a family outing. Click. Family reunion. Click, click, click. All right? Go through the, you're walking through the, you know, down the hall to your cubicle in the, in the big bullpen area. I don't know what they call it now. We used to call them bullpen, big area where they have cubicles. You'd be going click, 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 right? What if you could take that click button and make them disappear? Click, 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 click. 
you would create some space in your life, right? Put this in your notes. Lifestyle of wealth isn't clickable. It's buildable. A lifestyle of wealth isn't clickable. It's buildable. That's a good one right there. Can I give you some insight? Let's, let's use the old ancient manuscripts. I love this. The ancient manuscript. When you open it, you hear, oh, dust. Right? Proverbs 14, 23. Look at this. In all toil, circle that. Do you have any grit today? All of a sudden, something blindsides you. All of a sudden, toiling, oh, I'm just so tired of doing this. I wish this would finish. I wish we had finished this project. Oh, I'm just so tired of working. Toil. You know, I'm just tired of doing that. Whatever you do, whether it's data processing through the day, whether it's creating things, whether it's getting products to market, if it's service-oriented where you're serving customers and you're going through the task of the mundane of your daily routine. Oh, my God. What would happen if I could just morph right there alongside your desk? Bing! That would be cool. You're in the middle of it. You're saying words that aren't in the Greek. And all of a sudden, I just show up. Hi! I'd love to say this. In all your toil, there is profit. If you would remember in the heat of the moment, in the hard work, in the hard press, in, in the, the passion and in the pressure, that toil, there's profit. It would make your life a little easier. You may say, you don't understand. Oh, I know I don't. Well, I know I don't. But I remember when I had to change my business model and it didn't look like much. It took a lot of faith. It took a lot of foresight. It took a lot of confidence security and I some some ingredients of grit that I put in my heart along the way when people weren't looking when people were cl uh, sleeping when they were crying about their spilt milk I was fortifying my heart so that I could take this next step didn't look like much for the good ones drop and I kept looking at each other and going I hope we heard correctly she looked at me and go man this is going to take a long time get back to work I was thinking, man, they just look at me like an ATM machine. The household of the Goodmans. I found out there's value in being an ATM machine. You don't believe so? Turn that ATM machine off around the corner when you try to get money out of it. We know who's in control. That ATM machine. That's right. <laughs> you know how it is. When the family needs money, ATM machine's not around. Where's he at? What's he doing? When's he coming back home? Can I text him? Is he accessible by email? Right? We know who carries the buck. Come on now. If you're the breadwinner in the home, you throw your shoulders back, throw your nose in the air. You've got value, baby. That's right. They just haven't seen my demand request. It's in the email. Send it snail mail. No. But see, watch. Something happened in us. I went, look, this doesn't make sense to the present business model. This doesn't make sense to the colleagues around me because we had a certain business model that was doing very good and building a lot of profit. But the problem was in that system, you would go through seasons to where you're having to find clients. It wasn't consistent. And so, yeah, you had peaks. If you looked at a year, peaks of revenue, peaks of profitability, and all of a sudden it would just valley out and wash out. And we didn't want this peak and valley lifestyle. We want a consistent growth that's traceable, scalable. You can put it down on paper and see it happening. See, for all of you that go out every month and create your income, God double, triple bless you. I understand what that's about. My entire career has been that way. Never have I had a guaranteed paycheck. The one that I create is the guaranteed one. And I'm kind of confident about that. I'm self-reliant on that. I believe in my ability to do that more than someone else. And because that's the fiber inside of me, there's my grit place. There's my grit nugget. Is I can create wealth for my family and I need not look to somebody else to do it. Therefore, it doesn't matter what economy I'm in. 
It doesn't matter whether my product or service is in fashion or not. Because I will create one. I will reinvent one. I will produce one. Does that make sense? I'll repurpose one. And because of that, that adds to your grit. If you're that kind of person, get ready because the future is yours truly. It is truly yours. In all toil, there is profit. But the mere talk tends only to poverty. That's the difference of the person with grit. See, there's the grit and there's the quit. The one that's got grit will make it and succeed. The one that has quit in him complains, talks about it, dialogues about it, always studies about it, and never takes action. That's the difference. So you're faced with a two-edged fork, a two-edged knife. Grit or quit. Real simple. So we've got to ask ourselves, what tribe are we a part of? Are we the quitters? The quitters are always complainers. They complain before they quit. They complain, and then commitment goes out the, out the wazoo. I've been around in many circles enough to know this one. So what happens is there's complaining. Then there's discontentment. And that fosters the complaining. And then it starts to draw a conclusion as to the why they should quit. It's a whole dialogue. They get into a euphoric state. And before you know it's like a tornado. They just all... And a group of them just gone. You know, we look around, we go, did the rapture take place? No, they just changed locations. Right? But, but watch, but the person that has grit, there's something in them that says, you know what, I'm tougher than this hurricane. I'm tougher than the tornado. I'm tougher than the low budget. I'm tougher than the no money coming in. I'm tougher, I'm tougher, I'm tougher. And because you're tougher, guess what? You'll make it. Your toil becomes profitable. Now guard this. Sometimes we toil over things that will never produce any profit. Shuck and jive, shred that stuff, move on. Amen? Take that file and burn it. Seriously. So be very conscientious of that that I'm toiling over. What's its produce, production and how profitable can that make me in my future? Does that make sense? Remember, we're talking about a fortress and wealth building. For a fortress to remain hundreds and hundreds of years. It has to be fortified on a bedrock precept, principle of engineering, that can withstand all the elements, right? Uh, environment, the erosion that takes place naturally, and it has to stand there beyond it. And the reason it has is because very elaborate engineering went into its development. Put this in your notes. All toil. Choose your hard and pressure point. Oh, life is so hard. Honey, it's all hard. Oh, life is just so hard. It's just so hard. We've had people tell us, all, I'm like, have you ever tried to create a job for someone else? That's hard. Have you ever tried to hire somebody and, 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 and get work out of them or production out? That's hard. It's amazing to me when you hire somebody and you're the owner of the company, your first employee wants to make as much or more than you without producing anything. It's like, how's that? But it's just something in, in some human nature. So it's all hard. But you've you got to ask the question, what kind of hard am I willing to give my life to? I've had people come up to me, it's so hard to serve Jesus I'm like, really? Check this out. He's nowhere around. How can it be hard to serve somebody that's not present in front of you physically? It's just so hard to be a Christian. How, why is it hard? You said yes to Jesus. He said yes to you. You choose to follow his precepts. He doesn't come down and hit you in the head in the morning because you chose not to. He doesn't put like a chain around your neck and drag you to the ne It's not hard. He doesn't incarcerate you. And so you're going to follow me. Now you're following me. I'm putting you in this prison cell for eternity. No. He says, I lay before you life. Lay. I spread it out in front of you. It's not hard to follow Jesus. It's hard to have the knowledge of God in you and choose to rebel against it. That's what's hard. 
Oh, that got an overwhelming amen. Shaka ka. It's hard to know a truth and conduct yourself totally opposite of that truth. It's hard to know that you're created to do this and yet you constantly, through choice, do something else. That's hard. That's a pressure point. But I have bills. We all do. No matter how great of a wealthy person you are, you will always have some form of a bill. A bill is called a commitment for credit given. Well, no, I'm going to live debt free. Great. And you'll stop building anything on the planet. Even the wealthiest people, when they go to build something, they don't take their capital and use it. Newsflash, they leverage the money from the bank. Well, we're going to lend and not borrow. I'm going to lend and not borrow. No, you're not. You're only fooling you. Your mirror's lying to you again this morning. Hello? Hello? Newsflash. Because the wealthy understand how to use people like use money. Okay? This is true. It's true. When they lend their money, it's with gratuity attached, which means they put it into stocks, if you will, and the dividend comes quarterly, repayment. While the stock or the initial money given in is still growing, that's called the gain. So for us to have these little cliches, they may sound good amongst us in our little peer group, but we wonder why the world scratches their head and goes, Oh my, oh my, silly, silly. Just insight. So there's profit in all toil. Look at this. Many can discuss, dialogue, and opinionate. Many people can do that. You should do that. I believe in good discussion, good debate, good argument. I'm not talking fighting when I say argument, arguing a point, or, you know, debating a point. I believe in that. That's what makes us unique as a country. That's what makes us unique as people. Watch. Toil, not talk, produces profit. So there's a point of even dialogue that we've got to come to a solution, resolve it so we can move forward and actually start to create and build something. Does that make sense? So um, innovation will come out of argument arguing why the present product doesn't work effectively or efficiently. That's good argument. As long as we transition to res resolution, resolve. Does that make sense? But here's the difference. The person at the backside of this verse that merely talks and ends in poverty is a person that only wants to discuss, only wants to dialogue, is very opinionated, and their opinion's the only one. And it leads to no profit. It actually leads to poverty in their life. So here's how you can give it the acid test. A lot of talk, a lot of babble, no dabble, <laughs> and no profit. When you see nothing on the tree, it's vain vapor speech. How do you know them? The master said, by their, yeah, by their fruit. Why did he curse the fig tree? Because the fig tree in its divine nature is supposed to bear fruit in its season. And in the season it was to bear the fruit, the master walks by and cursed it because it was out of sorts with its season. Physically impossible for a fig tree to not produce at that given moment in time. So he cursed it. So it never could produce. Imagine that. Some say, oh, Jesus is a loving God. He's a lover. He's a lover, not a fighter. You're right. But he also doesn't tolerate nonsense. He looked at a fig tree and went, that's nonsense. You're supposed to have figs for me right now, and you don't. It's the season of figs. You don't. You're just leaving. You're putting on a show, and I'm not buying a ticket today. So he cursed it. His disciples, a few days later, were on their way to Starbucks. Walked right back by that full fig tree. And they went, the fig tree that the master cursed the other day is dead. It's not doing it. It's not figging. And then they realized they serve a master when he speaks. He speaks with authority. What he says comes to be. He does. 
And they understood that a fig tree, let me just correlate this, a person that should be producing fruit in this season of their life and is not, they're barren in their life and they're not producing, are out of favor. Ouch. I don't buy that. Let me give you another precept. This is off notes. Jesus gives an example. I'm going away to a far land. I'm going to give this one five talents. I'm going to give this one two talents. And I'm going to give this one one talent. Is that right? One, two, five. When he sojourned and came back, he took an appraisal. He evaluated. He had an accounting. He looked at the one that had five. He made it ten. Oh, well done, faithful servant. The two became four. Well done, faithful servant. The one that became one, what did he call that one? Say it again. A wicked what? A lazy what? Servant. He called them servant, did he not? He called them a what servant? And a what? But still servant. Isn't that interesting? This is the loving, compassionate, ooey-gooey Jesus. Agape, sloppy. This is Jesus. All of love, all of God, all of man. This is Jesus. Eternity was put in him. You believe in him, you have eternal life with God. All truth is in him. No guile found in this man, the writer said. And yet he says two servants, three servants, wicked, two good and faithful. Isn't that amazing? Moving on. Can we take some more today? Talking about building the fortress of wealth as a wealth builder. Paul said as a wise master builder. And that's what I want you to be, a wise master builder. He was building ships. Tents was his business, but he was speaking to shipmakers, a wise master builder. And he was speaking to carpenters, people that built buildings of the day. So when he said wise master builder, it could take many different applications. To us today, let's talk about building lives. Lives that endure the stand and test of economics as well as time. Okay? Look at this. Convenience can erode away your grit. If you're a person that always moves to convenience, your muscle of grit is diminishing. It's becoming lethargic. If everything in your life becomes easy because you move to convenience and never challenge yourself, eventually, guess what? You'll be blown away like chaff. Because some point in time in your future, it's going to require of you to buckle down, to buck up, to cowboy up. All these great terms that we've heard. Get some grit. Become a baller. You hear me? That's a soccer term, so please. Football term if you're in Europe. It's going to require something of you. And if you always move to convenience, you will conveniently waste away and erode away your ability to withstand and endure. Did we not, and were we not told by one of the wise master builders, this race is an endurance race? I always say to drop, and I'm really cultivating my thought processes. I always look at her and I go, you know what? The turtle finishes also. I say, I say to him at least a couple times a week, the turtle wins also. The turtle, the turtle finishes also. Do you hear me? It's a precept. It's an absolute truth. You can't keep having movement in a given direction, toiling and not see, as this verse says, profit. Moving on. How's wealth build? All of you people that study this ancient manuscript. Here a little, there a little. Yeah. Watch this. Statistics are in my favor. Say that. If I believe the precept of here a little, there a little, statistics are in my favor. Startup right now, only about 4% make it. People that are in um, direct marketing, direct sales, MLM, only about 1% of them succeed. Those that make six-figure income, about one-tenth of 1%. Go and look at the figures. I may be a little off, but they haven't changed much over the last five, ten years. 
People making six-figure incomes in an MLM company make up for one-tenth of one percent of all those that signed up. And people think that's their, that's, woohoo! That's my lottery, baby. That's right, I'm going to draw circles into a new lifestyle. Mm-hmm. I'm going to have caviar dreams and shame bang wishes by drawing circles. Hope so. That tells me you're a one-tenth of one percenter. If so, you could give your, your thought process to any enterprise and become a multimillionaire. That's just to be a six-figure wage earner, to make $100,000 or more. So if we see that business model, and it's worked for some, very few, and we call that a successful business model, imagine you that have your own enterprise. They go out every week, take a product, and create a profit. Have a service, go out every week, and create a profit that's traceable. And, next word, scalable. You're more than a one percenter. You're more than a one-tenth of one percenter. You're a prodigy. You're, you're something of great value. Do you hear me? And we need to look at our personal enterprises, our personal businesses, our personal um, working and ability and internal value as such. I look at people now that want to give me one of these, you know, I've got a great opportunity for you. I go, no, you don't. It's not, good as, it's not as good as the one my wife and I are giving ourselves to. Trust me. But, 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 but trust me, it's not. But scalability, I can outscale your brain in a second if you got some time. True story. I just had that conversation this week with an individual. I said, isn't that amazing? Your scalability scaled yourself right out of a, a job. True story. If they've got the golden grail, why do they jump from one to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next? Just wonder. Think about that. See, if we're going to build wealth that endures, businesses and enterprises that endure the test of time, let's look at some of the old ones on Wall Street. The stellar companies that no matter what the government did, they're still here. No matter what social peer group did and, and um, environmental uh, changes and all the environmental laws, they're still here. No matter what the trend was, they're still here. Does that make sense? And guess what? They'll be here tomorrow. Let's move into some things right now. Man, it's still early, way early. I'm popping today. Five elements of convenience. Five, five enemies to convenience. You want to know those? Remember what I said? Convenience will erode away grit. To the athlete that gets it easy, one day, it's gone easy. To the athlete that's got a blood and guts it out, suck it up day after day after day, grind it out, grit it out. Eventually, when they're on the mountaintop, they'll value the road they've tracked. Do you hear me? Number one is commitment. Commitment is an element of agreement. It's the beginning point of a relationship, whether in a relationship uh, compatibility uh, like a couple relationship with you and a company relationship with you and an organization a charitable organization you and a religious organization commitment let me go to another commitment you and you that's one of the best firms out there what company do you represent me and me <laughs> me and me enterprise I got your back. It's my slogan. Me and me. <laughs> but what's this commitment? Commitment is really not in, in our society. It used to be the bedrock of our society of the 1900s. It started to change. Some different mentalities and, and uh, thought processes started to come and, and push away the term commitment, and uh, especially in relationships. You started to see by the 1960s, 70s, the term relationship for a marriage didn't mean much anymore. We could, you know, it, they become recyclable. We can throw this in a way and get another one, right? Over and over and over. And I understand there's bad times. Sometimes the two, wrong, two people come together and it, it just isn't right. They didn't take the heart to build it. They didn't have grit to build it. So they divorced it. I'm not here to judge any of that. It's not my point today. My point is for us to understand commitment. 
Because commitment will impact every element of your life and lifestyle. If we're going to build a fortress that withstands time, that it has a, that's a wealth center, if you will, we've got to begin to understand it's going to take commitment. Your life and lifestyle takes commitment, just like the commitment you made to your spouse, just like the commitment you've made to your children, if you're a parent, for their well-being. Look at this. It's the beginning point of a relationship that must be continually reviewed. We committed to each other 30 years ago, but are you committed to each other today? We took a vow and an oath to each other 20 years ago, but are we taking that same vow daily to ourselves and to that other person in our life today? Next, watch this. The beginning point of relationship it's just the starting point. It's not the sum total of. It's got to grow from there. Does that make sense? Watch this. Many find this hard in our present society to commit. Oh my goodness, I can't commit to your company. I, I don't know if this is what I want to do for my career. Okay, great. You answered the question whether we should hire you or not. Oh, I don't know if I can commit to this project. Oh, great, you answered the question. We need to repurpose this to someone else. Oh, I don't know if I could commit to that. I don't know if I could commit to that. And before you know it, you have built an entire lifestyle of no commitment, not even to yourself. But no, I'm committed to myself. No, you're not. Because if you were committed to yourself, commitment to others would be easy. Because as you sow, you reap. If you're committed to yourself and being the best you you could be, you'll be the best you for someone else also. Amen. Commitment. If you can't commit to being the better you, watch. Why should anybody follow you? Amen? What would happen if the family divorced that person? Oh, we're family. We're divorcing you. <laughs> I think they call that an intervention now. I don't know. Anyway, but good thought, right? What is it? It's when we break down in commitment. Commit starts, commitment is first to self. We can't commit to God until we commit to self. I'm going to commit to give God the best product to work with. Amen? If he gave his life for me, I want to make sure I give my life for him. That's commitment. Commitment isn't always for convenience. Usually, it isn't convenient. So here's the problem with commitment in pre present society. Many find it hard because they bring the fears of the past into the present. They bring the disappointments of the past into the present and the broken relationships of the past into the present. So commitment is very difficult for them. Well, that's simple. Resolve it. Just resolve it. Today's a new day. We're growing in a different way, so let's resolve the past. Because the past can only, and history can only repeat itself when we take it into our future. Does that make sense? Proverbs 10.4 A slack hand causes poverty. Notice it didn't say the evil one, the devil, evil forces, demons. No, it said a slack hand. Now, unless the devil's on your hand, then we need to adjust this. But chances are the devil's not on your hand. It's the slack hand that creates poverty. It's the lazy hand. It's the hand that becomes lethargic. It's the hand that, that loses its muscle capacity. It's feeling. It's touch. Ability to grasp. It becomes paralyzed. So we could say the paralyzed hand leads to poverty. I don't believe you have a paralyzed hand. I believe you need to rethink some things and freshen up some commitments. That makes sense? Watch. But the hand of the diligent, look at that, makes. What's the difference with this hand? It creates. It develops. It deploys. It engineers. See, this hand's active. And this active hand creates movement. And movement creates potential for profitability. Does that make sense? And in that movement, 
New things are realized. In that movement, the promise materializes. In that movement, your faith takes fruition and creates. Does that make sense? Things materialize when we move. Ever have a good movement? When you have a good movement, you just go, ah, that's worthy of a cigar. It's a boy. It's a girl. I mean, it's just like giving birth. It's like, oh, that was a good movement. Come on, this is natural. The body has to have a movement. You put things in, they move all the way down, and they come out the other side. Movement is good, right? When you have an RN that lives in the house, well, what kind of movement was it? <laughs> Inspector Gadget. Right? Moving on, look at this. So the rich hand <laughs> is industrious. The rich hand is, in, uh, is always looking and always doing, always applying. Does that make sense? Watch this. Let's move to competent. Because see, we can have commitment and be incompetent. But I'm talking about those things that will erode and they're the enemy of convenience. Remember we said convenience is good, but convenience you can't count on. Remember we talked about that? Watch this. Commitment and then competency. Do you realize if you don't lift your level of competency... Promotions pass you by. You can believe all you want. You can have faith statements all you want. You can have raw, raw sessions all you want. But if you don't increase your competency, you will be without a job. Because time evolves, skill sets move forward, and yes, what? People develop themselves. It's the way it works. You can be an old, valued employee or just an old one. All right? Watch this. So competent. Do they have the skill set? Can they do it? Ask yourself this. Do I have the right skill set for this endeavor? Can I really do it and be truthful? You have two ditches with this. I'm like, I can't do it. I just can't do anything. And you go, you're right. Shut up. Let me help you. Then you have the other side. Oh, I can do it all. I can do it all. They can't do anything. You say, shut up, you can't. So somewhere between these two points is the sweet spot, right? And we've got to determine and become self-perspective and, 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 and self-observant um, uh, um, and say, am I, am, I, am I delusional? Am I deceiving myself or... You know, if I can't do it, well, how can I do it? And what skill set do I need? What do I need to learn? Or if I can do everything and I really can't, let me stop lying to myself and to others so I can find a way to accomplish it. And if I can't find those two points, hire it out, outsource it, recruit the talent. It's real simple. But you've got to be on a road of continued development. Or you'll be not even relevant. Not even useful. Hello? Last time I checked, people that are going out there right now hammering out foundations to put new ones in, they're not using the old pick and shovel. They're using a jackhammer. Does that make sense? Things evolved. You better become a jackhammer specialist if you don't have a job as a, I don't even know what they call that, de demolition crew. Or know how to light dynamite, one or the other. But you're going to have to evolve, right? Moving on. Practical and workable knowledge. We've got to ask this question when we're looking at somebody or ourselves. Am, do I have competency? Am I competent? Do we have a practical and workable knowledge? Now let me say this to people that are in spiritual circles. Sometimes we have cliches, and I've got to ask the question. I'm sorry, I've been around too long. Is it workable? Because if it's not and it produces no results, let's find another cliche that makes more sense. Does that make because we're only making ourselves look like fools here, friends? Hello? 
But now if we get that relevant statement, slogan, if we get that one that really matters, we find that diadem, that nugget, that when we speak it, it resonates with people around us. So they go, yeah, that makes sense. I can do that. Now we're mobilizing people. I think that's what the master wanted from us. Right? Look at this. So is it practical and workable knowledge? Sometimes we give too much brain space and storage space to knowledge or information that's not even workable. Please don't ask me about 666. I could care less personally. Does that make sense? Some people want to rebuke me for that. That's okay. Rebuke all you want. I don't answer those emails. Straight on. There are other people that are scholars in that arena. Seek out their insight. Now next, once you get it, how are you going to change your world with it? Next, will you benefit your family with that knowledge? Because I'm tired of seeing philosophers, their family is destroyed. But man, I've got insight. No, you don't. You wasted too many years and too much brain space. Don't be one of those. Be old, mature, a person of wisdom, sought after for their insight because it's applicable. And it changes situations. One thing I like about one of the men in my life is yes, he was a Bible thumper, but everywhere he went, he brought change, real change, to where it literally put food in hungry bellies. Big difference. Moving on. That was my soapbox for today. Watch this. Ask this question Is it wannabe or authentic skill? I like the shark tank. They go, that's, that's a, a wantapreneur. Is it a wantapreneur or an authentic entrepreneur? Is it a wannabe or is it an authentic? Skill set determines. Still, skill set reveals. When you have the skill set to produce and take a product, product to market and you can do it over and over and over, like you see on this shark tank, and some of them come in with profitability, and the sharks go, why do you need us? I always scream at the television, you don't! <laughs> They're going to take a big cut. Just keep doing what you're doing and scale it. Right? But sometimes we need somebody to hold our hand, help us, you know, so we can really start running. No question about it. Mentorship is a great thing. Right? Next, watch this. Is it a cliche or real ability? Is it a cliche or real ability? I'll give you an idea. I met a man one time that had an MBA, many credentials in accounting, literacy, and in portfolio management. We hired him. Drop and I interviewed him. Hired him. We were very impressed with the individual. Very articulate. Very integrous. I mean, on all. I mean, on all nines. You could say this person is immaculate. Could, could dialogue with us. I could put something in front of him. He could just break it down. But the job wasn't for him to be an analyst for our firm. The job description was for him to take and meet with clients and bring those clients onto our platform. He felt miserably. Some would say that was a fish out of water. No, it's more like an airplane that didn't find an airport, pretty much. What am I saying? It can be cliche, or is it real ability? You better know, because credentials don't always reveal everything. Some people are very good at memorization. They can go to school for five to eight years, memorize, memorize, take the test, pass, and get a certificate and a degree, and their output is zero. They're a well-educated, non-performing, in-the-world person. Education isn't the end of all. It's just the beginning of. Amen? Moving on. Proverbs 12, 11. Look at this. Whoever, circle that. I'm one of those guys. Whoever works his hands, I'm sorry, whoever works his land will have plenty of bread, but he who follows worthless pursuits lacks sense. Look at this. So whoever works his land, I don't own uh, farmland. But what this equates to me in my life is assets, my holdings, 
my ability in the marketplace and in the markets, the, the uh, capital markets. Watch, my enterprise, those things that I have created that are revenue generating for me and my family. Next, revenue centers. Centers of revenue. You may say, well, I'm an employee. That's a center of revenue for you right now. And it will be the total center of your revenue if you don't learn some things or if you, you learn competencies and promote, get promoted throughout the company. That's not a bad thing. Some people do not need to own their own business. The reason being, they'll fail at it. Hear me. Some people work very good inside of the conduit that's already prepared for them. We always try to make everybody their own business owner. Some of them are incapable of owning their own business. It's going to be a shipwreck. So let's have a stellar career, learn to put money away in our 401k plans and our retirement plans. So when we actually do have the benefit of retiring, we can look at some other things in the future or become a a high-valued consultant to the company that you retired from. Not everybody can own their own company, right? Look at this. So it's a workable land. So it talks about ability and skills. The word work means having an ability and a skill set so that you can cultivate this land in this uh, precept or uh, proverb to make it productive. Does that make sense? It goes on to say, but he who follows worthless pursuits lacks sense. What's that sense? Does it mean the five senses? It could be. But I like to look at it like this. Appraising ability. Appraising ability. You're walking through the market. Some person that looks like they're in the know comes up to you. Hey, you know, I noticed that they always start with a compliment. Put that in your notes. Always start with a compliment. You know, man, that's a nice looking suit you got on. I bet you own your own firm. They always start with leading a a compliment. Then next they go, I've got an opportunity. A few of my colleagues, a few of my partners. We only look for a few people. We don't work with everybody. You ever hear statements like that? If you have or lack sense, you think everything's an opportunity. Pigs to slaughter see that as an opportunity also. I get to become bacon, bacon, bacon. Right? Is it really an opportunity? The person of wisdom will see that this is a worthless pursuit. Look in the context of this passage. The person who's working their land that has abilities and skills will have plenty of bread, but the one who follows worthless pursuits. How you determine a worthless pursuit is you have common sense. Not so common, but you have common sense. You have workable wisdom. You have knowledge and insight because you've been studying topics that may not be your your norm. That's how you build your sensibility to appraise and understand something. And I just go, that may be great, great opportunity for some, but not for me. I'm pursuing a different opportunity. But, 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 I know, that may be for some, but it's not for me. So you've got to know what you can do, and you've got to know what your limits are, and you've got to know what you bring to the table and be confident in it. So this brings me to being consistent. When I'm consistent, I know who I am. I know my place at the table. I know what skill set I've developed. I know what knowledge and insight I have in my industry. And I know my value. Does that make sense? Because this person becomes dependable. The consistent person is a person that's dependable. When you're employing somebody, number one question will come out. If you're sitting with a couple of guys and you're looking at a a group of people and applications and resumes, CVs, all all in front of you, are they dependable? Boom. Many people don't get the opportunity because they're not dependable. Many people get passed over for promotion because they're not dependable. Do you want to know the next question we always said? Are they late? Late people show up late for a date. Sorry, this date's over. Boom, passed. See, there was a point in my career, that's what I did a lot of. I sat and looked at resumes, and people know how and hire people to trick you on a resume. you got to learn to read uh, what's not there. Hello? 
You got to learn to read between the lines. You got to learn to read beyond the statements. You got to learn be- to read beyond how the sentence is laid out. So what you can do is interview the person, and whenever you ask them the question on their resume, their CV, and they don't articulate it the same way, it's because it's written by somebody else. So just off of the CV doesn't determine your hand. You're hiring wisdom. So you've got to be Inspector Gadget. You got to be. Sherlock Holmes. So is the person dependable? When a person is not dependable, you have, they have determined the ability of responsibility they can withstand. They showed you their breaking point. Reliable source of insight and productivity. Consistent. Many times I test people. In church circles and in business, I ask them questions. I already know the answer. I've already done the research. See, I know I have like dumb, fool, stupid written on my forehead. But watch. Try this sometimes. Get the knowledge. Get the insight. Get the answer. Then ask the question. And just see what kind of input you get. Now, in the church circles... Many times, oh, I'm a preacher, I'm a this, I'm a that, I can, oh, 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 I've heard all. You can ask my wife. There's been several times I have purposely, um, uh, especially in the church before, put people in a pulpit to see what comes out of them. And in under five minutes, I can tell you if they're called to be a minister of the gospel in a five-fold capacity when peop- uh, in front of people. I can tell you that quick. Had a man one time, let me give you a story. Told, I mean, he had all the cliche, he had all the statements down, the slogans. He could quote people. I mean, he was like a walking quote machine. Constantly asked me week after week after week after week, can I preach? Can I preach? Can I minister? Can I minister? Right? I got some say the body needs what I got. It was about like that. It about drove me over the edge. Finally, I got to a point and I just said, "Sure, Sunday's yours." Well, late, of course. Why? Well, angels. I was, you know, prayer. Oh, I was deep. We should get deep out of that and get deep in the chair so I could start church on time. Right? True story. Let the man take the pulpit. Less than five minutes, I look at drop and I gave her that look like he ain't. That he ain't look. But you're judging him. No, I'm not. I'm not judging him in his eternal resting place. I'm judging what he wasn't. He was out of position. He was not a, 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 a lecturer, a speaker, public speaker, uh, an orator, a minister, somebody that could, could, could you know, lead you through some things. I can't even tell you what the man said. Then on his deathbed, he wanted to give me his memoir. I'm like, oh my God. That's wild. I told Trump, he, he's given me his memoir and his two, two books that he studies with. And I, I legitimately, genuinely, I'm like, man, this is, this is incredible that he would not give this to his kid, he'd give it to me. You know, I was his pastor, his last pastor before he walked through the pearl gate. I opened it up. Half of verses page after page after page. Not even like, you know, Proverbs, like one and five. Not even that, just be Proverbs one. And then maybe three words beside. Like, this is sad testament of a life spent week after week for hours under some of the sharpest teachers of our time. And that is all you have is a memoir. Wasted time. Why? Because nobody ever told him, you are not a preacher, minister, teacher. When I told him that, he thought I was the Antichrist. Moving on. So we're going to be consistent. Watch. We've got to be uniform in our thought processes and behaviors. Does that make sense? So what we actually say, the knowledge we actually possess and carry, is uniform, thought-provoking, 
brings change and challenge, makes deposits of good value that people can actually build with. Can you take a little bit more? Still early. Proverbs 13, 4. The soul of the sluggard craves and gets nothing. While the soul of the diligent is richly supplied. When I looked through the memoir after his demise, I was probably more sad than his family. So I thought, my God, a life worth living is worth recording. And what I see on the pages, I'm going to need help of Holy Spirit to even get anything attached to it. There was nothing there. He carried this book everywhere he went because to him, that was, that was it. But see, when he opened his mouth, when he was around people that knew the difference, that had some insight and wisdom, could articulate and appraise, watch, it didn't gel. didn't make sense. It wasn't workable. I can sit with an advisor. He can tell me all about the market and the present economy. I look at him and say, okay, great. Can I see the... De- the portfolio you developed? Can I see your template, your, your model? Uh, 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 How did you make that selection right here in small cap? Uh, 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 I can tell you right there, he didn't do it. It's a purchase model that he's repurposing to his clients. I can tell you right now, um, when I, with, with ministers, I can hear a minister, I can tell you where the source, that message And this ought not to be. I understand grabbing a nugget and sharing it. Put their name on it where you got it, the source of it. Right? At least have that much integrity. But when all you do is buy your sermons on the internet, you're not carrying insight. You're carrying the internet. Move on. I got to get out of that rut right there. Watch this. Talking capacity now. Capacity. Are you scalable? Are you multitasker? What are your sufficiencies? So many times we focus on our inefficiencies. Let's talk about your sufficiencies. What are you sufficient in? Meaning, um, when you you grab a hold of it, the sufficiency, it's streamlined, man. It like flows out of you. Right? Multitask. You don't have to think what needs to be done. It's like you're an octopus. You got eight legs going at one time. I love being around that in an office. I love being around that in a, in a church, a place of worship. I love being around that when I'm in, around entrepreneurs. Team, I love to coach from that one standpoint because everybody, we got one goal. We're winning this freaking thing. Or I can get your jersey away from you. Right? Why? Because they're like an octopus. They have eight legs. It's just going. They're multitasking. And I find this, when you find a person of value, they multitask and don't even realize what they're doing. There's been times I've said to a person, I've seen that that gift in operation, I just go, hold on a minute, did you see what you just did? No, what? It's so normal and natural to them, they don't even realize it. Why? They're in their mode of operation. That's a valued gift. Valued gift. And that gift is of great value to your enterprise. If you're that person, throw your shoulders back, put your nose in the air because you're of great value. Stroll down the marketplace and get some tea. Right? Hey, in what society do we want people to put their head down, walk around like I'm going to a soup line? Give me a break. Put your head in the air. Amen? Like you don't care. Come on. When you're banging it and you're making it and and you're the top of the leaderboard, you ought to throw your head back. And when somebody says something to you that's trying to work their way up, go, that's right, baby. Whose name's at the top? Say it. Say it. Darren. Say it one more time. I like it. Darren. Yeah, say it one more time. Live it. Love it. There's nothing wrong with that. Because superstars know how to put themselves in a frame of mind to keep producing win after win after win after win. But what happens if I'm not on the top? 
You humbly celebrate the guy that is. Your name is Bob. Bob. Give me a B. B. Give me an O. O. Give me a B. B. You know why? People that create change celebrate whoever is instigating the change. That's how it works. But I find this. People that are insecure create followers that lie like this. Oh, can I carry your back? Can I open the door? Oh, oh I don't know. I don't know. I can, uh, I'll get, I have to pray and get back to you. I have to pray and fast and get back to you. Shut up! I want a superstar. Yes, we can do it. The Bible says we have faith that conquers. Come on now. The kingdom is not creating slaves. It's creating overcomers. It's not creating a soup line. It's creating people that will endure and take territory. Set up enterprises. Amen? Leaders in business. You get around salesmen that are on the top of the mountain. They're like, yeah! It's like Walmart showed up. What's that mean? Because Walmart does this rah-rah session before all their customers get there. Yeah. I am kid you not. I'll never forget whenever my big bonus was my wife and I went for, what, seven days to the Caribbean. I was like, yeah, I'm a rock star. Go home. You want my autograph? For what? Because I'm a rock star, a rock star. (sighs) Took her on a vacation of her dreams. Who got that for you? Let me hear. Let me hear. That's right. Big daddy did. (laughs) That's right. ATM. ATM is... I've got to get an acronym for that. That's good. I'll give it to you next week. Hey, there's nothing wrong with celebrating your success because you put the sweat out, you put the energy out, you endured the pressure points. Why not cheerlead and celebrate when you get the breakthrough? Amen? We know who the source of all life is. It's not a question of that. Amen? Let me give you some more. Capacity. Break point. What is the person's break point because of demand? Know your break point. Work right to the element and edge of your break point. Why? That builds more endurance. But then know to back away. Recoup. Regroup. Siesta. Then go right back to your break point. That's how you push the borders of your life and lifestyle. What's your carrying capacity? Unlimited or containable? How much pressure can you take before you break? Many people never experience that. They've never had so much responsibility on them for themselves and others. Pressure of finances. Pressure of taking care of multiple households. To where all of a sudden they don't know their break point. You better determine your break point. And a person of authority has experienced their break point. The place when the wheels came off the wagon. The place where you thought you were losing your mind and you lost it and then all of a sudden you found wisdom. (laughs) I've had that with like, I've lost my mind. I have no idea what we're doing. I have no direction where we're going. And at the end of spilling all that out, God goes, good, here's the direction you're going. Oh, thanks, that became so easy. (laughs) Come on, you're at your wits end. That's right. All my wit is gone. (laughs) And then all of a sudden, boom, eureka, something materializes right in front of you. You never saw and never heard. Capacity. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean to your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. Look at that. What a great affirmation to a believer. When you're at wit's end, get ready. Your path's getting straightened out. When you're losing your mind, the path is getting bright before your eyes. When you're at wit's end, that's right. Only God is witty and laughing because he knows your outcome. Amen? Only in God's kingdom can you fail according to man and be promoted in his kingdom. Isn't that crazy? Only in his kingdom. Can you take a little more? Look at this. All your heart. 
Heart is a container. What is its capacity? What's its measure? How big do you see it? Have you expanded it? I saw a chicken cooked in a bladder the other day of a pig. I couldn't believe how big the bladder became. What a cooking style. Only reserved to the elite of the elite chefs in France. Cook a chicken in a bladder. Hello. To them, when you say, you mean you're cooking in a microwave? That's just as crazy. Right? Because they're old. They do it all old school. It's an art. Yeah. So the capacity of that bladder under heat expanded and expanded and expanded. It created a new environment that incubated what it housed, the chicken. So when the chicken came out, it was tender. They literally peeled it off with a light fork right off the bone. Do you hear me? It became a delicacy. Maybe that's what's going on in your heart. Some say it's pressure and stress. God says, oh no, I've got a bladder going on in there. I'm breathing fresh into it. I'm expanding some things. And the meat that will come to surface is very tender, succulent, with a lot of flavor. Maybe that's what you're going through. Culture. Culture is the atmosphere of the brand. Culture is the art of the team and their process. Culture is the ambience or ambience that's naturally formed in the workplace. Culture. See, you can force a culture onto a workplace and into a brand. You can force it. Or you can look at it and evaluate and see it evolving and stimulate that organically. See, this is what's unique. is because it's not one size fits all. And you know what? There are no copycats. See, the culture is the fingerprint of your operation, your procedure, or your product. It's like the thumbprint. There's no two alike. Culture. See, it best flows when it's organically evolving. It just becomes. See, culture put ahead of Crucial processes that impact profitability will lead to failure. Right now out of uh, Silicon Valley, there's a lot of talk about culture. What's the culture of your company? What culture did we create? We created this culture in our enterprise. We're no longer an office. We're a community. I'm the mayor, not a CEO. You're city managers. True. This is true. This is a model of leadership right now, or it's actually on its way out, but was. All to try to find what's the culture. Culture is useless if culture is not productive and profitable. You can have all the culture of the hippie movement, and if nothing good comes out of it, it's a bunch of used up tents, long hair that got cut, and a bunch of daisy looking clothes that are sold at the five and dime store. Right? Here today and not useless tomorrow or un unusable. Or you can find what authentic culture is that makes your company and brand totally unique, what makes that vibe in your office radiant and everybody wants to gravitate to it, what makes it totally separated than other people in your space, product wise, and you can foster that. But if culture takes away from profitability, your company and the culture you created will be empty space, rentable tomorrow. So keep it in its proper place. In spiritual settings, we can change culture so much that it's no longer a spiritual setting. We can change the culture and the feel and the vibe of it so much that it's no longer distinct by belief system. And I don't believe that's what the Master was asking us to do. It said, be culturally aware, right? But also be separated from among them. That talks about belief system, not location. Moving on. 
our culture should organically develop, then it's truly authentic. Be true to the real you. Romans 8.28 And we know that those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to His purpose. Let that be the ingredients of culture. We know that for those who love God, the culture of the Goodman household is we love God. That's one thing that we contend for continually is our love for God. And we know that no matter what we go through, everything, all things, work together. Now that throws you because some go, oh, so that's why you embrace failure. That's why you like sickness. and dis-. No, 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 no. Don't take it out of context. In context, here's what it is. For those who love God, all things work together. That word together accumulates, assembles coordinates for the end resolve who are called according to His purpose. Notice the word are. Those who are. That word are is trying. Difference between the are here and a word trying. You're not trying to be called to His purpose. You are called according to His purpose. When you try to do something, then that takes away from its authenticity. When you are a thing, you are. You're authentic. So then, we that are authentic, we know this. No matter what we go through, no matter what we have to endure, everything is accumulating for our great outcome. Everything is accumulating for our success. Everything is accumulating for our development. Everything that we are developed into is so we succeed greatly at it. Does that make sense? Because at the calling, there is a purpose. That's what makes you, you. So many times, people don't take the time to know the real them that they become a copy of someone else. God's not asking us to be copies. God's asking us to be authentic. God's asking us to be teachable, understandable, or understand, have understanding. He's asking us to be competent. He's asking us to be compliant with His Word. He's asking us to understand how to reach into the culture of our time and be relevant. That's what He's asking. He said, take a light and don't put it under a bush. Remember that analogy? So no matter what the culture is or the bush of the day, we're still to be a light, not under it, beaming over it. Does that make sense? If the bush is the culture, and I believe Jesus was speaking into the present culture and in our culture, Him coming as the light of the world was not going to submit under the culture of the, the day. Was it going to hide under the culture of the day? He was going to beam a brighter light in his day. I think that's what we can do. Amen? Close your Bibles.